Good evening, everybody, and uh, it's a warm welcome to you in the webinar series in July for Web Platform for Dialogue. It's a forum for a discussion, a sharing of thoughts with intercultural, interreligious perspective, without any kind of border, without any kind of religious prejudice. We will just share our thoughts, our thinking procedures. So that would be in a long run, would be very, very effective to mitigate the conflict that is actually happening in our inner mind. Conflict is nothing beyond the preconceptions of different aspects. So I'm very much sure that with this platform, with this forum, we will definitely try to resolve some of the issues. And I'm really happy today that uh, our today's uh, special guest, uh, Professor Jen Lindsay, she's a wonderful person. I know her personally from the journey of KISI Fellowship, its international fellowship program in Vienna, Austria, where I first met her. And uh, Jen Lindsay is a doctorate uh, in the field of sociology and communication, along with she's a professor in sociology and communication in John Cabot University in Rome, Italy. Also, she's a finest person in the field of documentary filmmaking. And I really congratulate uh, Professor Lindsay for her wonderful achievement in the field of interreligious intercultural dialogue sharing and how her field is creating impact that in this quarantine period, she wonderfully made a wonderful film. So she will definitely tell us about something on her project. But today's topic is a very interesting topic of discussions from how we can actually de bias ourselves with the idea. So now I would open the floor to Jen, my sweet friend from Italy that uh, and if you have any question i really welcome your question but at the end of the session so jen it's open the floor to you thank you so much is everybody able to hear me all right i can maybe see a thumbs up okay good so i'm gonna go ahead and present uh, my screen so i can share a uh let's see a powerpoint with you guys i myself am a visual learner you might guess that from um, the fact that I'm a filmmaker, and so it is easier for me to learn things if I can uh, follow along with some kind of visuals. So I wanted to build a slideshow for you guys to follow along with, and um, that means I can't uh, see Svati telling me if the audio is okay right now, but Svati, why don't you pop your mic on and let me know if you can see my PowerPoint all right. Yes, it's perfect, Jen. Jen, we can't hear you. Please unmute yourself. Yes. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, and yeah. can you yeah. see the PowerPoint show? Yes. Okay, great. So let's let's start that again. So, uh, so I'll be talking about whether documentary films can change minds across social divides. And uh, in order to um, go deeply into this topic, I wanted to first cover some um, theoretical frameworks around how biases form. Jen, we can't hear you again. Somehow got. You know, it seems like my mic turns off yeah. when I share my screen. I wonder. I wonder how I can share my screen more effectively. It seems like my mic is going off when I share the screen. Um, let's see. Um, maybe is there, if I can present specifically a window, maybe? Yes, a window. How about that? Are you guys, are yes. you looking at the, okay, let's see. Let's yes. hope my 
audio stays on and you're doing the right thing. If, if my audio goes off, just pop right back in and tell me and we can figure a way to fix it. Um, so I'm not sure what the last thing you heard is, but I was just telling you guys what I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> which is uh, that uh, the fact that I'm gonna go into the, um, first go into the kind of technical theory of how biases are formed in the mind in the first place and um, explain then the role of the media in forming bias some prevailing research on how people can start to de-bias and deconfirm stereotypes that they've developed in their socialization process. And then tell you guys a little bit um, about a documentary film that I made on the uh, the veil that Muslim women wear, and specifically it's set in Indonesia, and my experience and how it's sort of helped start conversations and surprise people and change minds. Just so you guys have a little bit of a case study to work with. Um, so I'll just check in again with Spati. Are you guys hearing me okay? Is the audio staying staying clear? Yes, yes. Okay, awesome, great. I'll keep moving forward. So, okay, so part one, we're gonna go through the social cognitive, um, mostly the social and cognitive roots of prejudice and racism. Um, so I'm going to go back in time and start with 350,000 years ago. I don't know if you guys know what happened 350,000 years ago. But let me tell you, it is the date for Homo sapiens to have, have originated. It's our species emergence date. And that mean, and, and we as a species have been living in conditions of homogeneity for about 348,000 of those years of our entire species existence. So that doesn't mean we've all been living with groups of blonde people of course, but the point is we've been living in tribes of people who are just like us for most of our species existence. A very generous dating of social diversity can be found in the Roman Empire, where you start to see the beginning of a heterogeneous society, people of different colors interacting in different ways. But those societies were very hierarchical, not egalitarian. The heterogeneity you find in the context of the Roman Empire, for example, is there were different colors of slaves. <laughs> so that's not the kind of social diversity and tolerance and pluralism that we really are going for in the dialogue world. A more realistic dating of optimal social diversity is about 200 years back. That's the emergence in human history, of, in our species history, of diverse modern societies with egalitarian ideals. So. The point of taking you very quickly through the timeline of human diversity is to make, the point I wanna make is that 0.05% of our entire species existence has been spent in conditions of social diversity. So you can imagine the result of that very, very, very tiny percentage of our species diversity is that we don't know how to deal with diversity very well. We don't know how to deal with it socially. And also our brains haven't really caught up with this newly emergent egalitarian diversity that we're trying to build in the modern world. This, uh, this little chart will show you sort of, this is in the context of all of the history of Earth, all of the history of human evolution. The increase of the human population only is dated at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. That's in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s, when the human population kind of explodes into conditions of real diversity. So that is a very, very, very recent for our bodies and brains. But you know what, guys? It's not going anywhere. Human social diversity has been so-called let out of Pandora's box. And um, that march is only moving forward. There's no way that um, the world is going to get less diverse, even though, of course, there are some enclaves, um, ethnic enclaves that seek to preserve their homogeneity. But um, And there are wonderful things about diversity, lots of opportunities that emerge from the cross-pollination and hybridization of cultures and sharing of things, but there are also some real challenges. And many of those are rooted directly in our cognitive structure and the fact that we, the way we speak and the way we think and the way we react to each other very quickly is all built on the foundation of the fact that our species has mostly developed in conditions of homogeneity. So that leads us to the sort of major point that I wanna make in the first point of this uh, presentation, which is that through the trends of cognitive development and social development, we teach each other social biases. It is a result of very natural and actually healthy cognitive functioning. Our brain has evolved, the homo sapiens brain has evolved over 348,000 years to keep us safe, 
to keep us connected to our our own community, our tribe, our in-group, whatever you want to call it, and also to keep our identities positive. What does that mean? That means that um, I have to stay in a good relationship with myself. I have to collect information that makes me feel like I'm seeing the world in the right way, I'm doing the right thing in life, I'm allying with the right people. And I also retain information that proves that my enemies are wrong. So I'm able, my brain has developed some very, very um, strong skills to process information, the information it encounters as I move through the world, um, which is a place of an enormous amount of information. My brain has figured out ways to handle that information. Um, that optimizes my chances of being safe, staying alive, staying connected to my tribe, and feeling good about myself. Those are the three things that my brain has evolved to do. So how does it do that? It develops strategies to process and categorize all the information. Now, can you imagine if your brain didn't have the ability to process and categorize information and to rank that information according to usefulness and threat very quickly, you might have some trouble. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're, oh, I don't know. I'm, let's 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 go to a context where maybe a, a hunter is uh, in a forest, and he's just, he's going through the forest, and uh, he sees a, he hears a rustle in the trees, and he turns around and he sees an animal, a large animal. Like he says, it's, it's a mammal. It's got stripes. Well, orange stripes and white stripes. It's opening its mouth. Those are big teeth. A canine teeth. I do believe that's a feline. Oh, in the process of all of that thinking, I'm already dead. You see, I've seen a tiger in the bushes and it already ate me. As I've been rationally processing in a slow and rational, deductive way, all of the information cues in my environment, um, I just went too slow. So the brain, in order to keep me safe, in order to keep me alive so I can go home to my community, has developed these cognitive shortcuts to process information very quickly. So even before I turn around and see the tiger, I hear the rustling in the bushes and my brain says, run, get out of there, get your weapon, go, get, go. And that is how we stay alive. So this slide presents to you a theory developed uh, by psychologist Jean Piaget called schema theory. These are these clusters of information that the brain develops um, as a child is growing up that allows us to sort of sort information and attach certain uh, associations with that information. So I'll just, I'll read through this text really quick so you're not missing anything. Uh, we're living in a complex world that has a lot of information in it. Our brain needs to simplify that information in order to act fast. So schema theory, which is developed and applied to human development by Jean Piaget, says that all knowledge is organized into units called schemas, these cognitive frameworks that help us organize and interpret information. So if you look on the right here, you'll see like a schema of a dog. A, a do we associate the concept of dog with this assemblage of qualities, like a tail, good pet, it barks, it's loyal, it's furry, it's four legs. This, all of these qualities sort of go into, if you think of your mind or your brain, sort of a, like a, a set of drawers, you know, where you keep your clothes and your bedroom. If you think of a schema as, as, as a drawer where you put in all of the different qualities that you associate with a dog, and that becomes the dog drawer, and all the different qualities go into that drawer. So schemas, these drawers in our brain, are energy-saving devices that are activate automatically. They're stable, they're resistant to change, and they affect our behavior. So let's say I love dogs. I've never had a bad experience with a dog. I have a positive emotional valence that goes with my dog schema in my head. So if I see a dog, I'm like, hey, cool, a dog. And that is going to last, that positive association I have with dogs lasts for my whole life. However, when someone gets bit by a dog, especially at a young age, that little information piece goes into the dog drawer and they start to associate dogs with fear and with pain. And so their dog schema is very different from my dog schema. And their dog schema of fear is just as fast as my dog schema of joy. So these are deep, deep seated associations that are deeply placed in our cognitions that develop as we grow up and they keep us safe. They, um, let's see, I feel like there's a lot of text here. So I, I'm get, I don't wanna be too repetitive, but I'll just zoom in on these, these little red, 
words here. Um, it says that the schemas, the whole point of a schema of your cognitive functioning is to retain information that reinforces what you already agree with and discard information that is dissonant with what you already know and believe. You can imagine that these sorts of shortcuts allow us to cut through information very quickly and stay connected to our tribe and not get too bogged down into thinking too hard about how to act in this world. So what that sort of adds up into is something that psychologists have taken to calling cognitive bias recently, these information shortcuts that make life easier and safer, a way to simplify and systematize information that allow us to act very quickly in our social environments. So there are lots of cognitive biases that have been identified by psychologists. Um, the affinity bias, for example, um, primes you to uh, feel, to identify people who are of your own uh, social group, people that you are safe to have an affinity with, and to trust them more quickly than you trust people that you perceive are not of your social in-group. Uh, the self-serving bias will prime you to um, uh, do the best you can for your in-group and um, make sure your in-group is safer and more prosperous than a competing group, for example. Um, a confirmation bias, likewise, which will lead you to believe information that confirms uh, something that you already agree with. And likewise, the disconfirmation bias leads you to not believe information that flies in the face of what you've been taught. So your brain is working hard to make sure that you continue to believe what you've always believed. And that is that you and your in-group are the best and ought to be protected. And there are tons and tons of cognitive biases. This is just a little taste. I won't take you through this chart. I just wanted to show you that the this little wheel here shows you that there are about 250 different shortcuts that your brain is actively um, engaging as you move through the incredible amount of information and sensory environments that the world offers to you. So the, the, the point of this um, kind of very quick little crash course in cognition is to help you understand how very deep seated our cognitive bias is. Our brain is working over time to help us maintain our beliefs and our identity so that we can safely participate in our own group. And the other flip side of that is that these shortcuts and of healthy cognitive functioning also lead to ve developing very quick, uninterrogated snap judgments about other people, other social groups, and easily adopting stereotypes. So your brain and your social environment are working together to reinforce messages about in-groups and out-groups. You're, you're cognitively primed to be able to identify from a very young age who's in your in-group. It's quite fascinating. There's something called the cross-race effect. It's been detected in infants as young as three months old. They demonstrate a, um, a, a preference and an affection for people of their um, same skin color. I mean, this is a very, very deep-seated on the cellular level, the presence of human bias. Um, a, a, um, in, and a preference for one's own in-group. Um, and then as you grow up and you're in your social environments, you're receiving messages that only start to reinforce these bias that you're cognitively primed with to begin with as you come into the world. So of course you, are, you, you as a self are an individual, you're a distinct entity and you're different from other people, but you yourself have developed always in conversation with your social environments. So while you have your own unique constellation of qualities that make you an individual, you have been developed as a result of interacting with people in your social environment. So the word for this is socialization, a process of internalizing norms and values from external social environments and developing yourself in conversation with your social world. Now, sociologists and psychologists have identified, um, I'm going to skip a couple slides real quick. Yes, they've identified, oh, let's say about eight, um, what they call agents of socialization. These are the specific groups, institutions, and individuals that facilitate socialization. So the family, for instance, known as the prime, the primary agents of socialization. This is where so many people get their most basic ideas about effective communication and hygiene tendencies, do you take your shoes off when you come in the house? Um, do you, 
um, talk at the dinner table? How much respect do you pay your elders? What's your conflict style and your family? What are the gender roles that your parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles have modeled for you? In, in the family environment, you absorb so much social information that is usually not um, actively described. It's usually a very implicit internalization process of modeling the norms that the adults around you um, are displaying for you. And religion often goes hand in hand with the family environment. So if your family believes um, in a specific conception of the divine, you are most likely to be taught that conception as a child and to adopt it at least for a while until you start interrogating it more and individuating in your natural development process. Um, agents of socialization, uh, people move through different social environments and they learn different lessons, different norms and values in many different social environments in their life, their schools and their peer groups, through the media, uh, what kind of national messages you get on the state level, what kind of messages they're receiving about effective leadership or gender roles in the workplace. There's lots of different environments that shape us as people. Um, but of course, um, I'm going to, uh, well, I should just cover that. But the point that I want to make in this sort of, um, before I start getting more deeply into the media stuff, is that everybody is carrying implicit social biases. We're cognitively primed when we come into the world to uh, have a, a preference for our in-group. Um, which is not the same as uh, having a bias against other people, but we're primed um, to prefer our in-group so that when we start getting our social messaging in our family, school, religious, and work environments and our media environments, we're primed to agree not only that our in-group is preferable, but start to extrapolate that and thinking that, that the out-group is something that is threatening or harmful or even morally wrong or something like that. So it's very tough. It's very tough to combat um, the deleterious effects of, bi or at least the presence of bias, because everybody carries around these um, sometimes unflattering ideas about other groups or extra flattering ideas about their own group. Um, so of course there are some deleterious effects to the tendency to have biases, especially when they develop into full-blown stereotypes or um, social discrimination. So um, even though our brains were evolved by way of keeping us alive and keeping us connected and, to our tribe and feeling good about ourselves, these are positive adaptations that have become maladaptive in the diverse world. Remember, we've only been diverse for about 0.05% of our species existence. So this is a very new for us to be able to actively confront groups that we've naturally developed biases against. But it's so important because you can see from this list here that there are some really negative consequences um, to the naturally occurring biases in our cognitive, in our cognition and in our social environments. Um, I, I don't want to, um, um, take too much time away from what I wanna to say today. So I'll say that I'm gonna, I will give you guys the link to this excellent video about implicit bias, which is kind of the um, the sequence I've just narrated for you um, in the last few slides. This wonderful um, video from the New York Times talks about how as people move through their social environments and their media environments, they start to draw these associations um, with each other. For example, peanut butter always goes with jelly. And just like that association, so easy for at least Americans to make, you might also say that um, violence goes with black men, right? Or uh, terrorism goes with Muslims, you know, to be very crude and sort of just to give a very hyperbolic example. Um, but these, this kind of implicit bias, the reason it is so, so uh, of such concern in our world today is because it is very largely unconscious and people are largely unaware of the biases they cultivate in their sociocultural environments. It's sort of like it's described in the, it's described in the video here as a sort of a fog that we're walking through in culture that we sort of breathe in and we aren't even aware of as we grow up and develop. So to summarize everything I've just talked to you guys about, biases are facilitated on cognitive and social levels 
And cognitive functioning works with socialized in-group preferences to prime us for the prejudices that we engage as we're moving through the world. So let me just talk to you, talk to you guys a little bit um, briefly now about the role of the media in forming the social bias. The media, as you remember, is an agent of socialization. The media is a very, very powerful source of socialization in our world today, um, not just for young people, but for everyone at this point. Almost everybody is plugged in. We're plugged in right now all over the world. Um, different communications technologies have um, a lot of muscle for connecting people and also for dividing people. So mass media, you can give uh, credit to mass media for producing our sense of what is real and what is true and what is actually happening in our world. The mass media is a major source of the dissemination of information, which is a, sort of like a fancy media studies way of talking about how information is transmitted through cultures and across cultures. So media, the media, the stories that we get from our news sources are always laden with different um, perspectives and often the biases of the news producers or the political ideologies of the people that are assembling these narratives to explain what's going on with our world. But everything that we watch, all this information that we take in on the media and all the different media sources that we engage in is totally constitutive of our sense of what is real and what is true in life. So, um, hold on, I wanna just skip a few slides too because I don't wanna run out of time here. Um, so one thing the media is really good at doing is teaching us lessons about the other. In some ways that's really great. There are cultures, cultural habits, cultural uh, artifacts, songs, music, art forms, um, that we would never have really come in contact with if the media weren't busy bringing people more awareness of cultural diversity and distant cultures. We wouldn't be able to be having this um, event right now on the web platform for dialogue if it weren't for media connectivity. The downside of that is that watching things on a screen, just like the way information is processed in your brain, is very simplified, very one-dimensional, very systematized and very produced. You know, as a documentary filmmaker, when I point a camera, I'm choosing, I, I've decided what's the most important thing for my audience to know. And that's already uh, a narrowing of a perspective that my audience might think, well, well, yeah, but it's a camera, it's capturing the world for real. Well, yeah, but you're seeing it through my eyes. So it's already not quite uh, as, as um, as Hegel would say, the world in and of itself. It's already uh, mediatized in a way. So our experience of the other through the lens of the media has really shaped our approach to each other. Um, media has an immense amount of social power to entertain us and to shape our attitudes and values about each other. Uh, we're constantly being sold things. Um, the youth are particularly vulnerable to this process of formation. Um, but in as much as the media is an agent of socialization, it, a lot of research, a lot of research out there has found that, you know, media has been able to reinforce stereotypes that often are in place to sort of tacitly benefit the dominant culture and a status quo of keeping a uh, certain media producers in the limelight and uh, maintaining a certain power of the narrative since the winner gets to tell the story. So the media, the power of the media to reinforce stereotypes, racial and ethnic stereotypes can affect a collective cultural orientation towards its minority population. For example, if that minority population is defamed on a media platform, um, and also can affect people on the very individual level. Um, sociologists say that um, so socialization is happening on a macro level and a micro level. The macro level being what I just mentioned, like an entire culture's collective orientation toward its minority population or toward quote unquote immigrants or toward anyone who isn't the same color as the dominant population, but also in the micro level in terms of um, the self-esteem and identity formation of young kids who um, may or may not see themselves represented um, in the media. Um, and that can have some really devastating effects for them as they grow up and 
as they go through their social environments. Um, so this brings up a really important word for um, what I tend to study and think about, which is media representation, the ways in which the media portrays particular groups, communities, experiences, uh, usually with an ideological perspective, a set of ideas that has some kind of agenda. Um, so um, I'll just go ahead and read this. The media are a tremendously important source of social learning about prejudice. Members of socially disadvantaged groups have typically been underrepresented or misrepresented on TV, in popular magazines, and in Hollywood movies. So here's a list of people that tend to be misrepresented or underrepresented. That's I'll just save you from having to read through the entire list. It's basically everybody but, uh, you know, straight, wealthy, white males <laughs> um, has uh, suffered from some kind of either misrepresentation on the TV, some sort of um, hyperbolic, tokenistic, stereotypical presentation of their qualities or underrepresented, mean, meaning, for example, I'll give you a statistic that, um, uh, let's see, African Americans in the American context are 14% of the population, um, but they represent about 2% of all actors um, that are um, starring in Hollywood blockbuster films. So 14% demog demographic with a 2% media representation, that's classic um, example of underrepresentation. Another group, especially in the American Hollywood blockbuster machine, that tends to suffer from um, misrepresentation, chiefly are Muslims. Um, there's a lot of really interesting uh, scholarship on common stereotypes of particularly Arabs, which is of course not the same as Muslims. But this is another thing. Um, most Americans, if you ask them where Muslims are concentrated in the world, um, they will almost always say the Middle East. It takes a very savvy American to say the right answer, which of course is Southeast Asia and Indonesia in particular. So people just don't know this, and it has a lot to do with the fact that um, Americans and, and Western Western people and uh, at large um, are sort of infected, socialized with these schematized, um, one-dimensional ideas um, of you know what a Muslim looks like, what a black person looks like, what a Jew looks like, etc. Um, so media representation can can be um, that poor media representation can really have some deleterious effects on different populations. The, there, there are two victims here. There's harm to the people who are portrayed. Um, there's a lot of interesting studies on um, young people who are under or misrepresented in the media um, that really suffer um, in terms of their self-concept and their healthy um, identity development and growing up, you know, their tendencies to um, experience and and get um, acquiesce sometimes to um, discrimination in the housing and labor markets. But the second victim, in my opinion, is, is the harm to the audience, um, the viewers who passively sort of um, experience the development of these schemas that really impoverish their experience of the incredibly complex and rich diversity of the world because their, their schemas have been distorted um, about the true nature of the outgroups um, so I'm going to now move on to the third little part of my little lecture here, um, which is to cover some sort of research-based techniques for debiasing and expanding the in-group. The first two that I talk, at, talk about don't have anything to do with the media, and I'll just zoom through those really quickly so I may make sure I'm being complete. Um, but the third, of course, has a lot to do with the media. So um, a lot of fascinating research has shown that one strong mitigating factor for debiasing, which means disconfirming the schematic stereotypes a person has developed in the kind of interactive process of their cognitive and social development, is self-awareness. So studies have shown that if people start to become aware of the biases that they are carrying about the quote unquote other, um, this can sometimes mitigate the effects of um, whether they're um, acting on these biases in the social environment. Um, and so much more, there are um, so, 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 so much more to say about how people can develop more self-awareness of their biases. Um, but for example, um, if, if a person wants to develop their sensitivity about how they've been socialized in media environments um, to be affected by social media or memes, they, for example, can watch some documentaries that can teach them more about the 
way in which um, our media environments influence our um, social cognition. Um, moving on to the second um, sort of uh, research, uh, um, a research determined way to de-bias and disconfirm stereotypes is to develop meaningful contact across social divides. Um, so I mentioned earlier the cross-race effect. This is the thing when infants um, display a, um, a clear pre um, preference of affection for people of their um, own racial and ethnic in-group. This effect actually is mitigated when young children are meaningfully exposed to people of visible difference. So for example, that can be uh, children who are adopted across um, ethnic contexts. Um, within a few months of that adoption, they will start to demonstrate a preference and an affection for people that they know the best, not necessarily people who are of their racial and ethnic tribe. Um, so there's a lot more to be said about meaningful contact. Um, and you are all, I'm sure, familiar of, given the name of the platform, with the world of uh, interfaith, intercultural, interpath dialogue. There's lots of different words for formal uh, facilitation of meaningful contact across social divides. Um, so this is another strong um, sort of uh, validated methodology for helping people to start to um, extend their self-awareness of their own biases into um, an enacted sphere of actually um, um, making friendships, developing relationships, meaning making with people across traditions, across uh, across different life ways um, in a way that is um, emotionally and spiritually resonant for them. Um, so um, now I will start talking about the third methodology for de-biasing, um, which is a positive media represent representation. That's fair and accurate representation of all races ethnicities, genders, and sexual orientations. Um, more and more in the past uh, decade, um, their research has found that there are some a more concerted effort on the, on the part of um, major kind of global conglomerate, big media um, production um, productions to um, uh, create media uh, and disseminate media that represents um, people of uh, different social groups. Um, and um, it is really clear that positive representations of diversity um, have a positive impact on viewers. This, this slide talks about um, Sesame Street, an American public broadcasting product um, that is, is made for young children. And um, a number of studies have shown that the children that watch the positive examples of diversity shown on that, on that TV show um, develop more positive attitudes toward people of different races because they're seeing it represented positively on their television screen. Um, another 2016 diversity report showed that people in the United States are increasingly preferring diverse um, film and television content, and even that films with more diverse casts have higher global box office receipt. So I guess that's kind of encouraging if those films are doing better on the box office, then there will probably be more investment, if not for the sake of um, positive representations of uh, pluralism, at least for the money that it brings in. But I'll take it, I'll take it, that's good. <laughs> um, so positive representation is very important, um, not just, of course, for the people who are being described more accurately, um, more demographically accurately as well as more characteristically accurate. It can really help young people's positive identity development and um, inspire people to live bolder, more courageous, braver lives to grow past that elastic notion of the in-group. I say elastic because an in-group is a very fluid construct. Um, I was living in New York City on September 11th and I I always remember this feeling of, you know, on September 10th, I was a certain kind of a New Yorker. You know, I was a, a musician and a filmmaker and I was, you know, uh, had my people, right? I had my little in-group that I belonged to. But when the tragedy happened on September 11th, 2001, um, I was not just a New Yorker, but I was an American. I was not just an American, but I was a person who believed in peace and justice. And my notion of in-group expanded exponentially. So this is great. It's great that the notion of the in-group is so elastic because it means that it can be expanded. 
with certain methodologies, ones that I've talked about just now, um, self-awareness, meaningful contact, positive media representation. And these uh, three methodologies really tap into um, a broadening of what's called intercultural competence. The, the field, the study of intercultural competence is um, very invested in understanding what um, sort of different dimensions of um, behavior and also cognitive orientation um, constitute a higher level of intercultural competence. So self-awareness, meaningful contact, and positive media representation cover a lot of ground here. They give people awareness of different groups, um, more uh, accurate depictions of these of different social groups. Um, they can help affect attitudes and of course knowledge. And that really in my mind is where documentary film comes in. Documentary film in terms of educating people, in terms of conveying concrete knowledge um, through stories that are based in truth, um, tends to hold more social authority for relating something that looks feels like truth than a narrative or fictional representation of the world. And often documentaries are made by producers who have an explicit mission to raise awareness and to fuel social movements. Um, in the late, in the most recent years, I would say in the last uh, decade or so, uh, producers have um, started developing impact strategies um, for once the film is completed and they release it, um, which can really have con very concrete um, social impacts um, that people have started studying a lot about right now. I have um, here for you, if you want to take a screenshot or something, some examples of documentaries that um, have been discussed as having um, very concrete um, awareness impacts in their audiences, not just awareness impacts, but also some um, um, policy outcomes or um, some um, financial concrete um, economic impacts um, for people who are depicted in these stories. That's too long, I'm not gonna read that right now. But I just wanted to tell you guys, there's, for example, um, this idea that documentary films can change the world, they can bring awareness to populations, they can stimulate social movements, they can change corporate policies, they maybe even can inspire new legislation. Films that purport to be able to do these things are now being celebrated. Uh, um, the, the Brit Doc Impact Award, um, I think was launched around 2011. And every year there are five films that they highlight as being sort of kind of remarkably impactful on the social sphere. Um, so um, a lot of these have to do with um, being educational about different social groups and social environments. Um, others like The Inconvenient Truth, the movie, um, and the end of the line, another um, movie, um, tend to have a aim to make a positive climate impact, for example. Um, but there's this idea, Susan Sarandon says, she says, I understand the profound power of a story well told. Storytelling is what makes us human. It is our common currency and as such can be a powerful tool for positive change. Now, you may be asking yourself, how the heck do you know if an impact <laughs> is actually made and what does that even mean? Well, that is a really good question and there is a lot of scholarship on it, a lot, a very healthy field of debate um, as to how you know if a, you know, a documentary film has actually made a quote unquote social impact. So one has to choose some very clear impact indicators to calculate a so-called a social return on investment. This is a somewhat um, controversial notion that you can measure a social impact, but um, fortunately or unfortunately, it's become more necessary in um, this day and age when um, you know one can't assume that uh, you know a, a, um, a state broadcasting apparatus will be prepared or or interested in investing about somebody doing some truth telling about something that's going on in that in their country. So people have to be able to communicate to philanthropists, to donors, to private foundations, to companies that they partner with that um, their money will go to a good use. That there will be some social return on that investment. And I have a, here a quote from the Brit Doc um, Impact Awards Foundation when they made a sort of they wrote an impact um, report for this movie, The End of the Line, which is about um, overfishing in the, in the sea, in the oceans. 
Um, and so they say, capturing the impact of a film is no easy matter. It is hard to distinguish the effect of the film from other factors. It's difficult to find ways to measure intangible effects and appropriate data can be expensive to gather. Many films rely on anecdotal advice or common sense to establish their impact. And the lack of hard evidence presented can lead to cynicisms that films achieve anything other than entertainment. Well, I have to admit that's true, although there are lots of interesting and helpful resources. For example, the Fledgling Fund, um, they invest in projects they feel will make a social impact, has developed this sort of infographic to help explain how a media project can have some kind of world-changing reverberation. Um, the second rung, when you start you know, from that, that center circle, the media project, the next rung is increased public awareness, people being aware of the problem that is being described. And then a, a social movement is stimulated with increased public engagement. The social movement strengthens and at last culminating in the enforcement of that change in the form of legislation, for example, um, being changed. Um, there are lots of things that filmmakers can do to increase the potential of social impact from their film. They can um, you know, do everything they can to get that thing all over social media and promote it. Uh, they can partner with NGOs who have similar missions um, that, of the, that which the film is speaking to. Um, they celebrity endorsements and then people you can invite to screenings who can be social media influencers to talk about the film and talk about the issues that the film evokes. Um, and, and above all, the, one of the, the clearest impact strategies that seems to have an effect on audiences is to get films into classrooms and to prepare some sort of um, cur curriculum where people will be primed with small group discussion questions or some sort of downloadable a uh, clear um, way to engage with the content of the film and then later to take action in some very clear way. So produ film producers can do a lot to push their movie forward. Um, so I'll just take you as I, I, will, I will wrap up very soon, I'll just spend my last minute or two telling you about um, a film that I made, um, which is about the Muslim hijab, The Veil, um, which um, is a film that I made because um, I found myself to be a very, very, typical example of a Western American woman who was, uh, I, well, I didn't even know that I was ignorant about the purpose of the veil, but I certainly was because I had some ideas um, about it that, about a very typical Western ideas that women were being uh, oppressed, right? That women who had to wear the hijab were really um, suffering from a, um, you know, um, <laughs> a, a very parochial, um, systemic oppression and I felt very sorry for them. And this is a reflected by a lot of people who just don't um, have a lot of exposure to Muslim women, that don't have a lot of meaningful contact with the issue, nor do they have a lot of self-awareness about not having, about being ignorant <laughs> about the topic. So um, what I found in my conversations with Muslim women around the world, um, and particularly in e Indonesia where I made the movie, is that women who veil veil for lots of different reasons. They might want to veil because they want to prioritize their identity as a scholar and not let their gender distract from their work. They might veil because they want to um, assert their proud Muslim identity. Um, they might veil because they feel that it conveys modesty and piety. Um, some veil because they feel empowered to make the choice to define the boundaries of their own physical sexuality and their own physical presentation. And they say, I'm gonna draw this circle around myself and I'm gonna decide who lets me come in. So the the veil to my um, to my my delight to and to my utter surprise as a typical Western woman was something that was far more empowering, a result of a of a strong, sharp sense of personal autonomy is, of course, in environments where women have the choice to veil or to not veil, um, that, you know, I really, when I started learning about this, I really wanted to share that message with people. And so I made this movie, Jilbab, this is the Indonesian word for hijab. Um, and this is one of the very first documentaries I made. And I made it out of just like a very genuine, sincere desire to sort of communicate the complexity of a woman's decision to decide to veil or not to veil why they would um, often had to do with sort of a family habit, but a lot of women would veil for many years and then realize that she'd sort of grown out of 
of whatever her previous reasons had been for veiling and she would take it off and sort of redefine her identity and repackage herself in that way. And um, so just colloquially, um, I, I, I didn't, I, I made this at a time of quite a few years back and I, I didn't have a production team or you know any sort of distribution budget, so I didn't invest in a big social media campaign or anything um, to get it out there in the world. But I've I've used it as a teaching tool, and other people have used it as teaching tools at conferences and in classrooms for um, I don't know about seven or eight years now. And um, it is it is just incredible to see the sort of almost you know 180 degree turnaround on the perspective of especially young Western women and men who had believe the veil to reflect systemic oppression and started to embrace the much more accurate idea that there is a, a, a very complex array of reasons a woman would choose to veil or choose not to veil and that you just cannot put a Muslim woman in a box and attach some monolithic labels to her. And that that perspective change all comes from the experience of listening to the testimonies and stories of the women that are represented in this movie and um, kind of wrapping their heads around the idea that the veil can reflect a profoundly empowering act of individual agency. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, very, it's very um, meaningful to have this experience that I can sort of let these women speak for themselves and I don't have to just describe them. I can press play and say, hey, let them tell you why they wear their veil and sit back and I can watch my students just sort of being surprised and having their, um, all of their socialized, schematized ideas um, be disconfirmed in the process of listening to the testimony of these women as they speak for themselves. Um, so that is sort of just a very tiny example of a documentary film, very, very micro local in my classroom kind of impact. Um, and in the meantime, I'm working on other projects that I hope will have a broader impact. But um, that is my extremely extensive <laughs> um, journey for you through the process of cognitive social functioning, media socialization, positive media representation, self-awareness, meaningful contact, and what my little tiny documentary does for some people who watch it. So I want to thank you guys so much for listening to me, and I hope I'm sorry for going over time, but there you are. Oh that's, my, that's what my, I have. My. <laughs> it's a just, you know, a, a mind-boggling kind of presentation. Thank you so much. Well, this, I hope I'm not in know, a bad way. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you so much, personally. I actually came to know so many things from starting with the background and introduction regarding how it actually emerged into the mental uh stereotyping and the concept of psychology so we have a quick uh, two question if you uh, just uh, look in the chat box from shritama paul and from dr anirudh Burman, we have two questions so just a quick uh, review from you great okay Yes. Um, so, um, Shritama, is it? Um, so there are, um, unfortunately, uh, well, let me, the good thing about documentary film right now is that the, this day, the, the time that we're in right now is often referred to as the golden age of documentary film because media um, tools like um, smartphones uh, with really good cameras, amazing cameras, and editing platforms, even also on the same smartphone, have made documentary filmmaking and citizen journalism so much more accessible to so many more populations to begin to tell their own stories. You really see that in the, exa in the example of, um, for example, this is come maybe controversial a little bit, but um, the, the the Palestinian population um, that have had maybe two or three decades ago um, not really been able to tell their own story or speak, you know, give their own testimony of their example of the Israeli occupation. But with the advent of citizen journalism and documentary technology, the accessibility of it, they've been able to, you know, tell their own story in their own way. And there's kind of uh, debatable tactics as to this, you know, documentary and the, the quality of truth in those stories is always endlessly debatable. But anyway, to get to the point of your, your question, um, yeah, representation of a community by anyone other who, 
than someone in that community is always going to be problematic. So you could say for me as a white woman going around to these women in Indonesia wearing these hijab and asking them to tell their stories, like the story is still told from my perspective, right? And somebody could say that's really problematic. They're still not completely speaking for themselves and they ought to do that. And I completely agree with that. So there are um, documentary foundations that make documentary tools available to communities that haven't been able to lift their voices as much, that haven't had control of their own representation. Um, and um, it's true that there is always the risk when you put yourself into a media environment of having some kind of a backlash. Um, but I guess I would want to, I mean, not in a sort of white savior sense, but I would hope on their own part that the community could cultivate um, a dedication to the principle of communicating their truth, the truth of their experience as a higher principle than um, wanting to hide away from the risk of any backlash. Um, I'm a big believer in the power of a personal truth and that if you can stay clear-eyed about your own good intent for your community, um, the, there's always gonna be haters. You just have to accept that and um, stick with what you know to be true about yourself and your community. So, um, so I would encourage those communities to reach out to foundations that can get them tools to do so. Hope that makes sense. That's true, um, that's very true. And uh, actually, same thing happened with the scheduled tribe people in India that yeah. uh, uh, the government is trying so many things for them but what i believed and my phd is on on that particular aspect that if they're happy uh what they have and if they are happy with their indigenous things so let them enjoy their indigenous things not to just push them and bring them into the mainstream so i think let's enjoy their identity <laughs> if if anyone is you know, covering their heads with a hijab or well let's it be as their identity so don't try to push them in the name of uh giving the equality and equality is not giving something pushing and something creating a, a degrading treatment and on on that on contrary so thank you so much for pointing out these things and dr anirudh Berman would rightly say that this is a correct time to use the well and uh, <laughs> men women both in the time of COVID 19. <laughs> Dr. Berman, I love that question. Actually, um, I, so I'm in Rome, Italy, and Italy, of course, was where the pandemic first spread. And during the quarantine, I thought to myself, man, it would be so cool if some demographer could could calculate infection rates in yeah. the Arab world and determine if women who were wearing the niqab were probably safer than the rest of us. Yeah. And that could be like a strong argument for public safety. And I often reflect as I go outside these days like this, I'm like, we are all wearing a niqab right now. And yeah. I hope that people who are Islamophobic appreciate the irony of that right now, because it's like so important to wear a veil. Well, you were against a veil two months ago, and yet now you're wearing one every day. So can't you see that this, this particular instrument has some utility? <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite the polyvalent symbol, I, I would say. <laughs> in, in any case, yes. you uh, at shield these days. The head yes, shield. yes. So that's almost like a veil. Yes, <laughs> it is. You know, the, what that tells me is that, you know, I think especially because of the media representation of the veil, people have a um, a very narrow-minded approach to the the picture of a woman going around like this, but yeah. the fact that there were all women and men like this right now shows us that how narrow-minded <laughs> we've been. You know, it has so That's many right. different purposes, right? Shakti <laughs> Srivastava, Shakti Srivastava would like to ask something. Yes. Jeff? How far do you think the documentaries can be helpful in changing the process and effects of making collective memory that cognitive biases affect? Um, oh yeah, sorry. Right. Um, well, um, so at least um, there, there's a very interesting, very new actually in the last five years, there's more research that is emerging that is putting together cognitive theory and documentary films and the processes of uh, neuroplasticity that can occur when we start to encounter information that is new to us. And this is important, we've developed the skills to withstand the cognitive dissonance that we experience when our disconfirmation bias gets engaged and we encounter that information that is new to us. Like there were genocides that are, you know, 
comparable to the Holocaust? No, like can't be. Like this is cognitive dissonance a person might experience. If you are able to develop the skill to withstand that cognitive dissonance, then you become a candidate for neuroplasticity, which allows your cognition to actually change and al allow for yourself to be wrong. It actually takes a lot of spiritual strength to undergo cognitive frame shifting like this because you have to be willing to be wrong. You have to be willing to be a little bit stupid and uninformed to embrace, to humbly embrace your own ignorance. It's not something that people are very good at, I don't think. Um, and, and in fact, I, I see this as being one of the big difficulties on, in racial relations in the American context right now because so many so many of the of white people that enjoy their white privileges um, mm -hmm. are so well educated because they've had the privilege of education and they're so used to being expert and e excellent at what they do that they are very, um, they're not cognitively equipped to withstand the dissonance of their own ignorance that is attached to their privilege. Mm -hmm. And that's where you start to get reactions of fragility. So I think that this is not just a cognitive learning process, it's also very much a spiritual process to be able to practice the experience of stupidity, <laughs> of ignorance and have humility about sort of not having a kaleidoscopic omnipotent mind that can, you know, understand the the kaleidoscope of human experience. So I do think that that the more people that take on the charge to uh, acquire, you know, documentary instruments, I'm telling you, a smartphone. There, there's a film. There was a film at Sundance Film Festival last year, a do documentary filmed all on on the iPhone, and it won the highest top prize. It's called Tangerine. And so you people that need to tell stories that aren't you know, the same stories we hear of, of suffering, like the Shoah, um, they can, they have to start telling those stories. And I do believe that cognitive frame shifting can happen. It is a, it's a cultural process and we have to start learning how to do it and modeling it for other people. That's right. So uh, the last question of our uh, today's uh, presentation from uh, Professor Anupab Gorai. Uh, uh, could you please uh, read and uh, answer the question? Movies have great impact over people's psychology, but I saw that people's behavior changed very often. For instance, in Bengal, a film director called Kaushik Ganguly has made a film called The Story of Small People. Though the film worked well at the box office, people's change, okay, thinking didn't change. Why do you think so? Do you think people forget things very easily? Yes, of course. People, like I was talking before about cognitive dissonance. Um, sometimes um, a documentary film can be very, um, can tell an amazing story, but it can amount to a night of entertainment for people, right? And people go home and they, they're like, wow, that was, <laughs> I learned all about overfishing. And you know, now we're going to order some, you know, unsustainably farmed fish. <laughs> and it's really hard to get people to change um, change their behavior. We all experience in this in our daily lives of resolutions and ideals that we hope to embrace, but then our habits get in the way, and you know we're always an obstacle to the person we'd like to be. So I think that that's a very common experience, and so I think that there are some film producers who have developed particularly brilliant social impact plans that come supplemented with things like social media challenges. Um, that people can commit to, for example, signing a contract to, for 30 days, follow some very simple behavioral changes that links into the central message of the movie. Um, if you're able to come up with some kind of clear behavioral directive that your, your, your audience can engage in, um, which would probably be more successful in the context of like a small group or a classroom setting where people have community to support each other as they change, um, then yeah, I think a documentary film can make an impact. But I, 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 I'm not sure a documentary film can make an impact if it doesn't come with that kind of an impact plan because otherwise it does amount to an evening of entertainment and education and then you move on with your life. So um, there has to be some sort of tangential behavioral a suggestion that grows goes forth from the movie. Um, it's a complex process, changing your life, changing your thinking, changing your behavior. It is very tough to do, and some brilliant producers have come up with ways to do it. Um, but if it doesn't work this time, we just gotta keep trying, right? Absolutely, Jen, thank you so much for this wonderful session because, uh, it's very important to know how to use the documentary film for the sake of humanitarian approach. 
we always think that how to gain uh, financial support from documentary film. That is, of course, another aspect. But apart from that, always I believe that documentary have its own essence of the humanitarian way to do something in a collaboratively, in a collective approach. So it, it will reach as much as possible people in a very, very small scale investment. So if we are talking about the investment purpose, nowadays, as you rightly pointed out, that with the smartphone usage, the accessibility, without any kind of money uh, in uh, investing, we can have, if we have a concrete idea and what we like to do. So if we have the proper methodology, as you mentioned, if we have the path, if we have the goal to achieve, we will definitely do that. So. Uh, Thank you so much. I would not like to end up the session, but uh, uh, as time is constrained for all of us. So uh, whoever is present, thank you so much for your full participation in this particular webinar uh, series. This is a second uh, webinar in month of July. And I'd really, really thank you once again, uh, Jane. Uh, thank you. And take at your time. Yes, of course, Swati. I'm just going to send people my um, some of my um, uh, web information in case they want to see more of what I do. Uh, yeah, so the you mentioned too. you mentioned the movie that I made about um, the interface yes. movie that I made based in Rome during the quarantine, and the link I just sent it has a password that goes with the link to open it. Neelix is a password. It's my dog's name. <laughs> I'm really like <laughs> love my dog and <laughs> and then um, <laughs> the movie that I mentioned Jilbab about the hijab in Indonesia is in this portfolio the link I've just sent here um, and then my general website I linked um, further up there so um, so check them out if you want keep in touch if you guys have any questions if you want to talk to me love about to, the project to, you want to do I'd love to talk to you Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Definitely, whoever is uh, would like to connect with uh, Professor Chen, I will definitely share her email ID. And if anyone personally would like to connect uh, with her for any kind of project work or collaboration research work, love to be connected because uh, Jane is a wonderful person. And uh, so I think uh, dialogue is just a bridge between the researchers same mind because we have a motto that connecting mind in bits and bytes so uh, thank <laughs> you so much all of you here i'm <laughs> trying to uh, 